Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so now just start over. Salam alaikum warahmatullah. Uh, my name is Ali Jamil. I'm a, a, a internal medicine physician uh, at the University of Buffalo. And um, yeah, I was just uh, asked by Sheikh Omar to say a little bit about um, the power of Ms. Swag. So this is just a personal, this is just a personal anecdote. Um, but the last time I saw a dentist was in uh, 2017, the spring of 2017. And I had uh, two, two, two cavities at that time. Sorry, this mic is very strong. I had two cavities at that time. And um, I told the dentist that I didn't want the fillings and that I would just try to like be better and floss and whatnot. And then four years passed and I just saw a dentist last week and subhanAllah they did all of the x-rays, even the panoramic x-rays, and they didn't detect any cavities. And in that four years time, the main thing that changed, my sugar intake definitely increased. And you could definitely ask my parents and they'll testify to that. Um, but my MISWAC use, um, I started really using the MISWAC um, in the year 2017, 2018. And not super religiously, but I'd use it like at least once a day and at least with like morning and night. And subhanAllah, I think that's like the main thing um, that really changed. And uh, I thought it was just like a miracle before my eyes were made to the x-ray. They didn't see any other cavities. So alhamdulillah, it's very important to do um, this whack. And there are other dentists, specifically at the University of Buffalo, that feel that good oral health is um, compared to having good overall health as well. So inshallah. Yeah, that's really awesome. All right, Miss Mahmoud. Alhamdulillah, Rasulullah so I hope you're all able to hear me properly, uh, those of you that are online. Uh, so today I want to talk about the importance of Al-Aqsa to the Ummah and what is the significance of Al-Aqsa. And so I want to first start talking about it from the Sira perspective, which is the Prophet Sallallahu had been giving da'wah in Mecca for almost eight years and less than 120 people had accepted Islam. As an alternate base, he felt maybe if I go to another city, he finally went to Ta'if, we know what happened there, that dua that he said when he was in Ta'if, we also know how the Prophet felt about that. Then, you know, Amul Huzn also had just prior to that had taken place, Khatija had passed away, anha, and Abu Talib had also passed away. So from the perspective of the material causes of the world, absolutely all the doors were shut. Meaning in the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, from a materialistic perspective, from the world of cause and effect, everything was closed. At this moment, two things happened. Number one was the meeting of the Prophet ﷺ with the jinns. And number two, the Isra, the Isra and Mi'raj of the Prophet ﷺ. At that moment. Why was the Prophet shown? Or why was the Prophet given this journey? At this moment in his life. Number one. Number two, what is the significance of that particular location that the Prophet was taken to this specific place? He, Allah could have taken the Prophet straight up, right from up. But no, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the Prophet on a land journey before he took the Prophet وسلم, up to a, the Mi'raj. So what is the significance? The Prophet وسلم, was being given a map of the future. And the Prophet وسلم, was being given a map of the holy territories. In fact, 
let me just remind you of the word aqsa, what it means, what it really means. Because there are many words that mean far in Arabic. Ba'id means far. It could have been Masjid al-Ba'id, for example. It could have had many other words. Shahiq means far away too. But aqsa is a very particular word that comes in a very particular context that when you understand what this word aqsa means, then you begin to say, oh, okay, okay, that's what it's really trying to say. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَ الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَةٌ Now this same wordings are used in Quran twice. One time in Yasin, another time when a person came to run to Musa alayhi salatu wa salam. وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَ الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَةٌ قَالَ يَا مُوسَى And another time, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَ الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَةٌ قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ it is the far boundary of something. So in this case, in these two verses, it's referring to the far boundaries or the farthest boundary of a certain city from which people came running to the center of the city or near the center of the city to talk to or to communicate with the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Al-Aqsa is not just a far mosque. No, this is not the purpose. Allah says in Surah Al-Maryam, which is right after Surah Al-Kahf. It is telling you the boundary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually set a specific boundary of these holy lands. What are these boundaries of the holy lands? These are the lands that Ibrahim والسلام, walked in. Generally, before we talk about Masjid Al-Aqsa, the general area is Sham. Alaykum bis Sham, the Prophet said. And the heart of Sham is Masjid Al-Aqsa. The heart of Sham, because Sham, the Prophet said, would have Ahlullah till the end of times. And Ta'ifa Mansura, the group that Allah will help till the end of times, will always be in Sham. And this is why one of the major places the help to the Mahdi in the end of times will come from Sham. And Isa alayhi will come down in Sham. So what is being done here? When the Prophet Nabi Muhammad وسلم, is being taken on this journey, he's being given the territory, the boundaries of the territory that are sacred. In fact, one thing I'll clear up here, not clear up, but it's you can say an added opinion that adds, you can say a certain taste to a discussion that many people have. You know the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet said, whoever does Umrah or Hajj, from Al-Aqsa to Mecca, all his sins are forgiven. The Prophet said this. And when the Prophet said, لا تشد, uh, لا تشد في رحالة, Some of the scholars feel this is what the Prophet was. He wasn't talking about like just making rihala in the general sense of the word, but rather in the sense of for Umrah or uh, within the sacred territory. Okay. So anyway, that's a separate issue. But the point here is, why was the Prophet وسلم, taken to, you know what you can do, Muhammad, can you come here? When people come in, can you just add, keep adding them into the group because I keep uh, Here you go. Just, you have to just add when it says, when more people come, let's see, okay. All right, bismillah, alhamdulillah. So, Al-Aqsa is the place, to, and there's another hadith of the Prophet وسلم, I'd like to share in this same context of the sacred land. Because the land of Sham is Barak, has Tabarruq, has blessings. And the land of Hijaz has Aman, okay? Wattini wa zaytun wa turi sinin wa hadha al-balad al-ameen. This land that has Aman in it. And Ibrahim والسلام, also prayed for this. But the point is this land of Barakah and this land of Iman or Aman. These are like you could say a pair. And the Prophet وسلم, was being given a map and there's a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, on the day of judgment the Prophet said, my hold, my hold will be to the extent from, from Masjid al-Aqsa to Mecca. This is what the Prophet said. وسلم. The hold of the Prophet وسلم, the, the width of it will be from Masjid al-Aqsa to Mecca. Okay? So now, why is the Prophet being taken to this land? 
this is a very interesting question. And part of the answer is that as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts this surah, Surah Al-Isra, that as soon as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the surah, there are a few very interesting things Allah mentions in this surah, but I want to mention that the Prophet was taken there. So let me give the conclusion. The Prophet was taken there to show him that your ummah, your ummah, will come to this place. Your ummah will reach this place. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, count six things before the day of judgment. Mauti, my death, wa uh, futr, the, the, the opening of Bayt al maqdas the opening of Bayt al maqdas And whoever controls Jerusalem in history, and this is the main theme of Sutul Al-Isra, by the way, the main theme of Sutul Al-Isra. One of the main themes that if you control Al-Aqsa properly, which the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad would do, if you control it properly, the fitnas go away. The fitnas what? Dissipate. This is why the door that was holding all the fitnas from coming was who? Huh? Umar. And what happened when he went to Jerusalem, what happened? They gave it to him. No questions asked here. Because he was the door that did not allow the fitans to come in. And as long as you have Bayt al maqdas under your organized righteous control, the fitans would what? Dissipate. Who is another person that will come and remove the fitnas? The Mahdi and Isa alayhi and his jama'ah. Right? So if you take control of Aqsa and you bring righteousness to it, the fitans what? Go away. When Aqsa is not in your control, this is a sign the fitans have been released and the Ummah is being tested. And to further describe this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, What is the verse? وَقَدَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ And we ordained it on Bani Israel because the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَيَأْتِيَنَّ عَلَىٰ أُمَّةِ مَا عَتَىٰ عَلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ حَزْوُ النَّعْلٌ بِالنَّعْلِ All those things will come to my ummah that came to the previous ummah. And I've talked about this subject before, but I want to talk about it in more detail. You see, the Prophet is being, the, the Quran gave us a map. All those things will happen to you that happen to what? Bani Israel. At the collective level and individual level. At the individual level, the Prophet said, if one of them goes into a lizard's hole, you will also go into a lizard's hole. Shibran be shibran. You'll follow them hand span to hand span. So as much as Muslims may sometimes dislike Bani Israel, the people of Bani Israel, we are just like them in many ways. So what happened in Bani Israel? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ila bani fil ardi marratain. You would cause fasad in the world. What is fasad here? Fasad is not obeying the laws of Allah, which Allah gives in details the 10 commandments in the same surah. The Ten Commandments that were given to Musa والسلام, are in this surah, meaning Allah is saying, you didn't follow these laws that were given to you, and that caused fasad in the world. The Ten Commandments. The point being here, Allah says, Ya Bani Israel, O Bani Israel, la tufsidunna fil ardi marratain, wa la ta'lunna aluwan kabira. And you would become very arrogant and transgress all bounds. When the first of those promises come, we will raise our servants against you. Oh, wait. Who is Allah talking to? Who is Allah talking to at that time? The former Muslim Ummah, the former Muslim Ummah, Bani Israel, they were the Muslims. And who Allah would raise against them, they would be what? They would be the non-Muslims. But what does Allah call them in this verse? فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ أُولَاهُمَا بَعَثْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ إِبَادًا لَنَا أُولِي بَعْسٍ شَدِيدٍ We will raise against you a very strong, warring group of people. لِيُنْذِرَ بَعْسٍ شَدِيدٍ is similar to those words. 
فعصني عليكم إبادة لنا أولي بعص شديد فجاسوا خلال الديار and they will enter into your houses why? because you didn't obey the laws of Allah and not obeying the laws of Allah led to what? Al-Aqsa, Jerusalem, the first Qibla being taken away from you. This happened to who? Happened to the first Muslim, the, the former Muslim Ummah, Bani Israel, in the hand, the first time. It happened in the hands of the Assyrians. Happened in the hands of the what? Assyrians from the north. And then what? The Babylonians came and destroyed Al-Aqsa and took them as slaves to Babylonia. Okay, this is the first time. What happened in this Ummah? Same thing. From the north, we had the Crusaders come. And the Crusaders and the magicians of the Crusaders, the Knight Templars, they took over Al-Aqsa Masjid. And we had the Tataris, they came from the east, just like the Babylonians came from the east. So the exact picture that was done to them was done to us. So Masjid Al-Aqsa was taken away from Bani Israel how many times? Twice. Masjid Al-Aqsa was taken away from the former Muslim Ummah how many times? Twice. Why, wasn't it take, why was it taken away from them? Because they were not what? Do you believe in part of my book and reject the other part? What can be the reward of those who take to this attitude in la fil hayat al dunya? Except they're put to extreme humiliation in this life. You think you're humiliated here and you'll be safe there? Doesn't work like that. But over there it's going to be worse. And you're humiliated here. This, one of the lessons in this is, if you're good Muslims, if you're good Muslims, Allah will give, open the doors for you. If you're good Muslims, Allah will open the doors for you. Allah will open the doors of stopping all the fitnas by putting Al-Aqsa in your hands. And if you are not true to Allah, and if you're not true to His Messenger, then Al-Aqsa will be taken away from you, and the fitnas will open, and what? You'll be put into extreme what? Humiliation. So the last prophet that came to Bani Israel was who? Bani Israel, the Ummah of Bani Israel starts with two prophets, ends with two prophets. Who were the first two? Musa and Harun and Isa and Yahya. So now when the final prophet of Bani Israel comes and he comes with the greatest miracles, the greatest miracles that they could have ever taught. But you know what is the uh, what is the punishment of the one who is a magician? What's the punishment in Sharia, in law? You kill. So what did they say? You know, they said, uh, they said to Isa they, they, they tried to assassinate him on the charges of doing that. This is in Surah Saf. So after that, Allah said, okay, you're not going to listen to my prophets. What happened? The Romans were already over here. I want to share with you something interesting, just so you have a historical perspective of this and how similar it is to our situation. When Zakaria, just within a generation, look at the difference. When Zakaria was raising Maryam, where was he? Where was he raising her? In the in the masjid, in the temple. They tried to kill Zakaria. After that, his family was kicked out from the center of the city. Yahya والسلام, did all of his da'wah outside in the wilderness, in, outside the city. He was not allowed inside the city. Because they killed the family, the Ali Imran, they killed the family, they removed them out from the city. And then what? They killed the father and then they killed the son. Who did this? Which group? Because look, the first rise of Bani Israel happened in the hands of Talud, then Daud, and then Suleiman. Then there was a downfall. In that downfall, the Assyrians came from the north, the Babylonians came from the east. Then there was another rise under the hands of which prophet? Uzair He gave the second rise to Bani Israel. And there was a new now after that, the Maghabi power. 
you know, just please listen to what I'm saying. It's very, very important. The same thing happens in our ummah. There's a rise and then there is a fall. Then how did the, who brought the second rise of this ummah? The second rise of this ummah. Where was the initial beginning of that? Nuruddin Zanti, Salahuddin Ayyubi, taking back Al-Aqsa, then the Ottoman, the Mamluks, and the, the Sanjuks, Tatari, and all these, then finally the Ottomans, right? The second rise of the Ummah. Just like this was there, after that there was a rise in Bani Israel, the former Muslim Ummah. They had the, it was called the uh, Maccabi power, the Maccabi empire, Maccabi empire, under the hands of Uzair alayhi But then who came? when they again now started to disobey Allah. The powers, the Romans came. When, when the Pharisees, the ulama of that time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were they answering their questions to? Do you remember which power was? Remember, they kicked Zakaria out and they killed him and they killed Yahya. Now they were trying to kill who? Isa. Isa is not Okay, which power was trying to kill him? The, no, which power controls Jerusalem at this time in history? The Romans. Titus. Titus, the Roman, the, the, he, is the, 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 he is the one that is after these, the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And who is in cahoots with this, the Roman Empire? The number one cahoots with the Roman Empire at that time. The Pharisees, the ulama of that time. The ulama of Bani Israel, they were the ones that were the most against the prophets of Allah. The Sadducees and the Pharisees. And the, the, the carbon copy image is of what? That who was in charge of the Muslim world at that time of Bani Israel? The Roman Empire. Right? And it is during the, that time that Isa Islam comes. Now, in our case, will be the same, 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 almost scenario. The, the Roman, the Rome, the Rumi, the Western world has hegemony over the world, and it is at this, at the end of this period, that what Isa will come back. But what is the real lesson here when it comes to Al Aqsa? It is not about Palestine. Palestine is a secondary issue. The primary issue for the Ummah, for the Ummah of Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the issue of Al-Aqsa and what it represents. Now, let me share with you something important. I'll come back to the historical aspect of this. But before that, I want to mention the Prophet went to Jerusalem and he prayed there. He what? Didn't just pray there. An Adhan was called there. And the Prophet led the prayer of all the Prophets of Allah. And a stone was put there. Now, this is enough. In the olden days, there are many masjids in the desert. All you put there is a stone. That's it. There's a stone in the north, meaning in the front, in the back, in the sides. There's no walls. There's no what? Ceiling. Nothing like that. You just put stones, and that becomes what? Masjid. The prophet went there. Adhan was given by who? Jibreel. And yeah, you know, the, the Prophet led the prayers. And when he led the prayers, that became what? Any place the Prophet leads a Salatul Jama'ah generally becomes what? A masjid. Any place where the Prophet of Allah leads a Salatul Jama'ah becomes a masjid, number one. So this was a prophecy when Allah said in Mecca, where the Muslims were at their lowest. Allah was saying that is Masjid Aqsa, that that will be your masjid. That will be a place where Muslims will pray. And that will be the boundaries of the Muslim land. The importance of Al Aqsa is number one, it is the, you can say the litmus test to see how strong Muslims are in their faith. If you're strong, you'll have Al Aqsa. If you're weak, it will be what? Taken away from you. If you're strong, then what? The fitans will be stopped. And if you're weak, the fitans will continue and the sign of that Al-Aqsa is taken away from you. And the other aspect of this 
is that that masjid in which the Prophet prayed in Salatul Jama'ah with all of the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, that became a masjid and it became a prophecy. It became a prophecy that, in fact, when Allah says Masjid Aqsa to us, it sounds normal. But when the Sahaba were probably reading this in the early days, this is no different than when the Prophet was giving the bangles of gold and, uh, or Umar bin Khattab was uh, giving the gold of uh, bangles to uh, the person who was following the Prophet in his uh, hijrah, I forget. Huh? Suraqa, yes. No different than that. Masjid al-Aqsa. How it's Masjid al-Aqsa? We don't even have anything in Mecca. We can hardly pray in Mecca. We can hardly say La ilaha illallah in Mecca. How will Masjid al-Aqsa be a masjid? The other thing about the word Al-Aqsa is that not only it gives you the boundaries of the holy place, which is Mecca, Medina, and Al-Aqsa, this whole area of Sham, but also Al-Aqsa is used to tell you something that's far, but has a specific direction. Has what? Like a certain direction. And when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca, he used to pray towards the Kaaba, but the direction used to be towards Yerushalayim, towards Jerusalem. That was the direction of the Qibla. The Qibla was that. And the Prophet ﷺ, so the word Aqsa is also in this sense, in terms of, and the word Aqsa also means Ghaya. Ghaya means your goal. Ghaya means your goal. Aqsa also means what? Your goal. Aqsa is always the goal. This is why, this is why when the Ummah fulfills its prophecy, the great prophecy of the Ummah, what is the great prophecy of the Ummah? That Islam will come to the world. That prophecy, when it happens, where will the Muslim capital be? Hmm? Where will the last capital of the Muslim world be? Jerusalem. And that will be the sign that now Islam is the capital of the world. And so those promises of Allah that were given to the Prophet and then to the rest of the Ummah. Etc. Etc. I don't want to go into that. Uh, translation right now but the point is if you are true to the deen then Islam and you both will rise like Abu Bakr and Omar in the good times we had and unfortunately unfortunately you know I don't want to uh, sound uh, too negative because we have a tragedy on top of the tragedy if I say you know, something negative, then it can make people feel bad. But I just want to mention 1994 when I went to Palestine, one, I experienced many things that were very interesting. And I saw people of great faith in that place. But I also saw what? The Adhan is going on and the Muslim youth is what? Playing pool table. This is the masjid, like that curtain is the masjid and people are playing pool, they're pool tables. And the Prophet ﷺ, I just read this hadith today actually. The Prophet said that, that when that time comes, where people, when there are 20 people or more, and none of them fear Allah, when that time comes, that there will be 20 people or more and none of them fear Allah, and they would rather feel, I'd die. I'd rather feel what? So on the one hand, you don't fear Allah, and on the other hand, what you feel? It's better if I what? Die. The Prophet said, then wait for the hour. That time. And you know what happened? I came to the grave of a Sahabi in Palestine. I forget now which companion of the Prophet it was, but one of the companions, it was a great grave site with many companions of the Prophet. I saw one brother smoking. I said, brother, you know, I was younger in those times. I didn't have the, you can say the type of patience I have now. I was young. I said, what you doing here? You're smoking. And this the Qabr of the Sahaba, you know, you need to like move aside or do something. He said, brother, we're already dead. I'm just like these people in the grave. So, you know, that the point is that if we are true to Islam, then we'll be rewarded in this world as well as the next world. And if we're not true to Allah, and if we're not true to the messenger, then 
What will happen? Now let me read you the second. فَإِذَا جَاءُ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ This was about what? The first rise under Suleiman and Daud, Daud and Suleiman and then the fall through the Assyrians from the north and the, uh, the, uh, the, the Babylonians from the east. By the way, I just as a side point of history I'm mentioning, when the Muslims were taken from Jerusalem, okay, and they were taken to Babylonia, when they were taken to what? Babylonia. This is where they learned that magic. Anyway, the point being, they were there, and then Uzair was told to go to Jerusalem. And he was told to bring people, Muslims, back to Jerusalem. Bring them back to Jerusalem. Bring them back to the deep. It is in this that the ayans to al-Baqarah, How will Allah bring life to this city after it is dead? You know, uh, uh, The city was completely dead. Completely dead city. Not one brick was intact, according to historians. Not one brick was intact. And then he said, Allah, how will I bring people back to the city? And then Allah, you know, gave him the, the process he went through to show him. Then he went and he gathered the people and they finally came back. It's a long history. But then after that, they had a second rise. Then what happened? After they killed Zakaria, then they tried to kill Yahya. Then they tried to kill Isa a.s. Then Allah said, okay, that's it now. Haramun ala qaryatin. Haramun ala qaryatin ahlaknaha. What? Fa'idha ja'a wa'adul akhirati li yasooju hakum. Then when the second time this happened, the second time you did fasad in Bani Israel, la ta'lunna aluwan kabira. We will cause them to enter into your masjid the way that we did the first time. They will enter to blacken your faces and they will enter inside your masjid the way that they did the first time. Meaning, in our case, before Salahuddin Ayyubi, when the, the knights, the, the Templars, they did, and before that, when it happened twice to Bani Israel. The scary thing is, now what we don't know, now let me share with you what we don't know. If you only look at Quran, it seems like Al-Aqsa will be taken away from Muslims twice because it happened before. It happened what? Before. But there is some hope in one of the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ, which is an authentic hadith. So I'm hoping on that hadith to be true. Otherwise, if you only look at Quran and the Quranic narration of history, it seems like Al-Aqsa will go into the hands of the other side. And the same thing, our situation will be, you know when the Tatars took over the Muslim world? You know what the humiliation of the Muslims was? I'm sure all of you read the history, the, that a lady Tatari would tell a man, stand right here. I'm gonna go get my knife and come and kill you. And the man, the Muslim man would not move from his place. The Khalifa of that time was put under carpets and then the horses were ran over him and then his, bodies were, his body was thrown into the sea. And you know when the Genghis Khan gathered the Muslims, you know where he gathered the Muslims? Where they used to pray Eid. He gathered the Muslims in, the, it was it, because in, in, it was a Farsi word at the Eidgah, Eidgah, the place where they prayed Eid. And he said to them, do you know why I have collected you? He said, I'm a punishment of God to you. This is his, in history. I'm a punishment of God to you guys. And he butchered them all. Literally a scene of what we can say of malhama, like a type of scene of what will be happening in the future. But that's... So now Al-Aqsa was for uh, us. Now I'm talking about our ummah. Al-Aqsa was taken and then recaptured by Salahuddin Ayyubi. We had a rise. And then we had an, another what? Fall. And this time again, like the previous time, the Romans have what? Have the say, have the hegemony. And the result is the same. And 
the end of that was Isa alayhi salatu wasalam coming. The end of this will be Isa alayhi salatu wasalam coming. And so there is this question mark. Will Masjid al-Aqsa be taken away from us? And if it is taken away from us, then you can only imagine the reaction in the Muslim world that will be at that time. Allahu alam. But there is a hadith of the Prophet that I want to mention. The Prophet Dajjal will not enter four places. Generally, we read about the Dajjal will not enter Mecca and Medina. But there's another hadith of the Prophet that mentions four places. Dajjal will not enter Mecca, Medina, the Mount of Tur, and Al-Aqsa. Oh, let me also share with you something interesting and then inshallah I'll end. Uh, Sheikh Tamer, I hope I, don't, I didn't take too long. Uh, so just let me share with you two, two uh, pieces of information. In the case of the Kaaba, see there's this interesting relationship between Al-Aqsa and Makkah, particularly. Let me just give it to you in this framework. Makkah is where Quran came down. Makkah is where what? Quran came down. Al-Aqsa is where the Prophet went up, right? Makkah is also the place where a certain stone came down. What is that stone? The black stone. Okay, I'm going to tell you something today that I've never told anyone. Do you know that this black stone was one day stolen from the Muslim Ummah? Do you know this? It was taken to Iran. Why was it taken to Iran? And what we retrieved back, we never retrieved back the whole stone. We never what? Retrieved the whole stone that was given to the what? We never retrieved the whole stone. We only retrieved now what remains there is fragments of that original stone in that area. Graphite color. That's how you know which part is a black stone and you know which part is a paste that holds it. Okay, okay, yes. One of the interesting things is that this black stone seems to have a relationship with our hearts. Because when you do a sin, what did the Prophet say happens to your heart? It puts a what? A black dot on your heart. And as an ummah, when you sin, what happens to that stone? It puts a black spot someone has access to our hearts because they have access to the original stone that are still out there in the lands where these magics were formed now there's another stone one stone came down from Jannah the black stone which was white. But there's another stone that went up. I've seen it. I've been there. When Jibreel والسلام, came to Masjid al-Aqsa, which is that whole area. It's about 50 acres, that whole area. In that area, there many, there's more than one masjid. Generally, what we see is the Dome of the Rock with the golden... That's where the women pray, by the way. Generally, that's where the Women pray. The men pray in Masjid, uh, uh, masjid uh, the one that's in front of it, Masjid Tibli, I think it's called. Okay, but that whole area is Masjid Al-Aqsa. If there are uh, less people, then they pray in the Masjid, but in Jumas, generally, especially what I saw, the women pray in the Dome of the Rock, and the men, they pray in the, what is the, the Masjid in front of that, north of that. By the way, very important point that I want to mention. Uh, sorry, Sheikh Temer, I just want to mention this very quick. Before I talk about the second stone, I want to mention something very important. The wailing wall. The wailing wall. What does Allah say about when Allah took their masjid from them? What does Allah say? Allah said everything was what? Destroyed. Everything was destroyed. Now you have to answer the question, if everything was destroyed, where did you get the wailing wall from? That's a few thousand stones there. 
So are they praying at the wrong place? And the answer is yes. I'm not going into details. I'm just giving you the hint. Historical, very important historic. Do you know how they started to say the, the Wailing Wall is our, is our place? One of the rabbis who was a magician was the first one to say this. I will one day go into the history of this. This is actually a fact. They didn't know that the whole masjid was gone. Their temple was what? Their temple was gone. They just came in and the most beautiful structure that they saw was the one the Muslims made. And they said, oh, this could be it. Or did it have something to do with magic? That's something for another time. But the other rock was when the Prophet came with, with Burak into the Masjid al-Aqsa. And you can see this till today, the rock that the Prophet landed on. The Prophet took a rope and you can see the, they say in, in the narrations in it, you can see physically also, there is like a hole in one of the rocks that's like clearly like, it's like somebody drilled it. And the narration say that Jibreel put his finger through one of the rocks and the Prophet used that to tie the burak to that what? Rock. And when the Prophet went into his mi'raj, when he was ascending, that rock also what? Lifted itself. It's there actually lifted almost. Uh, a portion of that is lifted even till today. So what they say is that it was on the ground and then it lifted itself as the Prophet was ascending upwards. So there's, and then if you read the narrations of the time of Umar bin Khattab, it tells you that either that rock or another rock, we're not sure, but most likely this rock was the rock that was used to identify this is where Masjid Al-Aqsa is. And over here, I want to mention another point. When Umar went to Jerusalem and he was in the church, what did he say? He said, I'm not going to what? Huh? I'm not going to pray here because it can cause fitna. The Prophet was not going to go into their thing that didn't even exist to pray there. This is a mistake Muslims are making because we bought into the, the media propaganda. Their thing is gone. They don't, it's actually in the city of David, which is 100 feet, 100 meters away from where the actual Muslim Aqsa area is, where the Temple Mount is. That is our area. It is separate, has nothing to do with Jewish history whatsoever. Okay, has nothing to do with it. And I can like literally talk on that for like hours. They have found Roman coins there. They have found, they have never found any Jewish artifact on the Temple Mount till today. They have never found anything related to the Jewish religion in that, if that was their masjid, right? You should have some architect that has to do with their deen and sacrificing the animals and all the things that we have in Sharia. No. That place even has no natural water. And in the Jewish religion, if you study the Jewish religion, they don't do just wudu. They have to like go in deep into the water. If you go into a synagogue, have you been to a synagogue where they have the pools? You have to go into the water. You have to take a complete ghusl, basically. They do that even today. All these, there's a difference between a temple and a synagogue, but every temple, I mean, the, the, the temple is like their Kaaba, but synagogues will also have their pools of water where women, when they want to do tahara, they go to the synagogue and they dip themselves into the water. Anyway, that's a separate issue. But the importance of an aqsa for Muslims is, it is a litmus test to see how good the ummah is doing. And the prophet was told, and number two, the Muslims were given this and it became the Muslims because why? The prophet prayed there and Allah declared it as a masjid. Just like when the Prophet had the dream and he declared Aisha as his, huh? As his wife in his dream. He says, okay, this is your wife. Right? He had the dream. In the same way Allah declared it, and that was it. It was a masjid. And then it was given into the into a platter, you can say, just without any fighting, in a in a peaceful way, was given to who? Umar bin Khattab, radiallahu. And contracts that ex exist till today, you can even look it up online. What was the negotiations that were done and everything, you can still see that till today. This has absolutely nothing to do with the Jewish world at all. It has only everything to do with Islam and Muslims. Why they are interested in that piece of real estate? Well, I have, but you know, the simple answer is I don't know. I don't know because it has nothing to do with it. 
Okay, أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات. السلام عليكم. All right, I'm ending this, inshallah.